great. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's so great to see you and see your names. If I, that's totally okay if you don't have a camera on, but it's great to recognize your names and um, see you all here. Thank you for joining us. And I would love for, oh, there's Jennifer Gramling. Hey, Jen. <laughs> She's on. Um, so um, if you guys ever want to chime in, if something happens with my audio, please let me know, first of all. Second of all, or my um, anything about my internet. Also, if you guys want to chime in and interrupt me or um, have any kind of thoughts or want to expand on your own experiences or whatever, please do that. I'd love this to be as interactive as possible and um, for us to kind of go back and forth, however, you're going to learn best from this. So without further ado, uh oh, I can't share my screen, I don't think. It says host disabled. You shouldn't be able to know. Oh, there we go now. I got it now. I got it now. Thanks. Um, okay. Yeah, hold on one second. Okay, great. Okay, so can y'all see um, my PowerPoint now? Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay. Do this thing out of the way. Sorry for my issues, technical issues. Okay, here we go. So, um, I am going to just as a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. I am going to just briefly talk about RSA. I know a lot of you all are very familiar with it, and, and everyone, I'm sure, is using it in some form or fashion, whether we call it that or not. Um, but just a little overview about it. And then I'm going to talk about today our topic of discussion in the context of my course, Nutrition 100. So I'm going to overview what that course is. And just so you're a little more familiar when I talk about how I use this in my asynchronous online large lecture course. And I want, whether you teach a large lecture or an online or asynchronous or not, whether whatever you kind of connect with in um this toolbox, I want you to kind of glean that. And I know everyone's story is a little bit different. So if you want to me expound on any of those um, facets, please let me know. And then we're going to go in a little more specific about RSI, just as a review and an overview for those who just want a little recap of what that is. And then I'm going to go into combining all that and how I use RSI in my asynchronous online course and and specifically the assessment piece of how we kind of incorporate RSI into the kind of challenge of a large course. Um, so this is some of the great um, resources that we have um, here at UT um, with online learning. And at the end, I'll show you, um, I'll take you to this website. Maybe I, I won't stop here. There's the link in here. I want to just copy and paste that, but this, the picture here is basically the PDFs that in part are, are accessible on this website. And they go through a lot of what we're gonna go through today, but super step-by-step -step, um, process and strategies that are wonderful for everybody to use. And um, and we'll go into that a little bit more in a, in a minute, but regular substantive interaction is required by the DOE um, as a means of important you know, it's important for student engagement. And like I said, I, I think um, I could venture to guess that we are all using this in some form or fashion, whether we define it as this or not. But at the same time, I think we can all do a better job. Even if our, your class is as perfect as it can get, we can always find some area of improvement, I think, within ourselves and within our courses that we can either, um, you know, just take it up a notch or maybe totally revamp or whatever. There's always something we can kind of tweak and it's neat to kind of have certainly our services at UT to look at your programs and your classes to help that process. But also, you know, you can do it yourself a little bit as a first step. So I also, in my bold asterisk um, <laughs> um, comment here, I want to kind of reiterate that this is possible in asynchronous, especially asynchronous online courses, um, it sometimes we have a bad rap, those of us who, who um, you know, the thought of asynchronous online in the past is kind of, I don't know, bad rap, but just very distant. And, and 
um, not a lot of interaction. And I think that we can um, find ways around that and certainly keep the rigor of the course and RSI to be as great as possible in these courses when we kind of use it to our best advantage. So I'm going to talk about that specifically in terms of assessment in a few minutes. But before we do that, I just wanted to kind of talk about my course in general. Um, and that is that it is uh, obviously um, online asynchronous, as I've said several times, but I also have a face-to-face -face component. So it's the same course. And when I originally, well, uh, first of all, I'll say it, it does fulfill a ball core, used to be gen ed, natural science requirement, fulfillment, um, a non-lab NS course. And this has been the case for a very long time before when it was gen ed and now it's ball core. But um, then that is certainly aided in um, the, I don't know if popularity is the right word, but just, you know, the, the, the reasons that people take my course, obviously, as we all know, that, that certainly helps sometimes in garnering um, student interest and their need to take the class. So I do, I have certainly my own nutrition majors, but then I have um, like kinesiology requires my class. Nursing used to require, they don't need more, but Public health requires it. So I have some courses that require my specific course. And then, but the majority of my students are, you know, business or communications or whatever, just taking it as an NS course. But back um, in 2011, I started teaching in 09. And then um, in just as a reference, in, in 2011, it was, I had about 200 students. It was all face-to-face. -face. And that was, you know, a fairly good size at that time for this large lecture course. And I would do one, um, or excuse me, two lectures a week and one discussion section is kind of how it works. So in 2012, I went on to online way before the thought of COVID, right? So I was very blessed that when COVID came, I, I had a very easy pivot um, when, since I'd been online for so long already. Um, I can't believe it's been over 10 years already, but so all that said, I, this semester, I have about 1,500 students. So, you know, over 3,000 students per year take the course. And, and again, this is kind of off topic, but interestingly, this is kind of a point of interest just for online reasons to go online. The impetus back in 2011 for me going online, even though online wasn't, you know, it was DE, like distance ed at the time was to decrease this bottleneck because my course was kind of a bottleneck for kinesiology and nursing students at the time that they, they couldn't get in. And so it was delaying their course of progress, right? And so the thought was to expand um, the section so we'd have more capability with me still being the only instructor involved and then having graduate teaching assistants to assist in some terms or form or fashion. And interestingly, and you might not be surprised by this, the demand actually increased <laughs> when we went online at the time. Not so, you know, we were trying to, to to meet the demand. The demand actually went higher because of the fact that um everybody wanted an online class and, and it was asynchronous at the time. And I won't go through my whole process. Um, but that that certainly it's been neat to see how this has all evolved over time. But so I, I'm telling you all this <laughs> to say that. I, I've been in the asynchronous world for a very long time and um, have been able to see the, the, what works and what doesn't. And I know before I go any further that everybody's class is very different and some classes are perfectly set up for this situation. And I feel like Nutrition 100 is one of those because in the 200 student semesters, it was a large lecture format. I was in a large auditorium with, you know, hundreds of students. I would love for there to be interaction back and forth, yeah, but you know, in a large lecture, most students don't really want to interact in that manner. So we had a discussion section for that purpose, but I, um, I think the reason New Jersey Hunter works so well in this format is because doing an asynchronous lecture in, in my textbook and all that, which we can get into a little bit, but then watching my snippets of lectures in my textbook is about the same as them sitting in a in a lecture hall watching me with a big large lecture right and then we have the discussions and that sort of thing that we'll get into for rsi components but i think that's one reason my course works and maybe that's similar to some of your stories as well that it works well because of the the format and the way that we teach this material 
but okay, moving on. So, um, I, I, I won't get into all this either. My sorry, I went back to my backstory too much, but back in 2011, I did like my full long lectures, um, you know, 50 minutes, sometimes way longer than that. Cause I would do, you know, like my 50 minute lecture time. And I would sit in, in a room in the communications building or in a library with a camera and just do my whole lecture in front of nobody. Right. And that would be, I put that on Blackboard at the time, if that was that long ago. Um, and my lectures would be just be housed there. And it was asynchronous, but I'm very well aware that I probably did not have a large number of my students that were watching my whole sometimes hour and a half lecture, or if it was, you know, a lecture that would have been a two class period. Um, we had some data on that, but you know, it was it was a lot. <laughs> and I it wasn't um, I was just speaking off cuff. It wasn't scripted or anything like that. So um, come several years ago, um, with the help of our OIT department here, I condensed my lectures to be more, we call them micro lectures and kind of more YouTube-ish. And so I took my 50 minute lecture into like five to seven smaller little lectures on topic areas. And so at that time, before I wrote my book or anything, we consolidated to these micro lectures. And I, I'm telling you all this to say, I think those help um, with, I would say with the RSA, but also the students wanting to watch um, because they don't have to watch a 50 minute all at once and they can do it on their own. And they can also absorb it better because they can read some material, watch the embedded five minute lecture and then read some more and then watch some more or, or vice versa, or watch first and then read. But either way, um, that's, kind of how the setup of my course is. Um, and no, we can get into that a little bit more later, but that's what micro lectures mean is, is that I've taken my 50 minute lecture topics. And, and let me back up and also say, when I did record them, they were scripted. I had teleprompters. I had this amazing set behind me. I won't show you my um, book and my lectures on this um, presentation, because that's not what we're talking about, but they were fabulous in working with um, and helping me to have um, that be pretty timeless. And I have to go back in nutrition, you know, as a dynamic science. And so some things change, but digestion doesn't change for the most part. I mean, there are nuances in the microbiome and that sort of thing, but the way our food digests and is eaten and <laughs> absorbed, it kind of stays the same. So those, that material can kind of stay evergreen to some degree. Um, and then I can go add things as needed. So anyway, Back to some other things about my course. Um, I have a dietary analysis project, um, and that is a really crucial component of my RSI engagement in my course because it is an independent um, analysis project of their own dietary intake. So they do a three-day food record if they feel comfortable. We have alternate assignments for individuals that don't feel comfortable doing this for whatever reasons. But um, anyway, most students do participate because they're they're okay with it and they input their information into kind of like you would my fitness pal if you're familiar with that and then um through my publication we've created this independent tracker called diet tracker and then i ask them questions about their own intake so i'm telling you these details because the great news is there's no real cheating that can happen with that <laughs> because they unless they're using some Someone else's food lot, which is fine because they're doing the analysis on them. But there's each person has to do their own. So finding activities that um, can be very applicable to students so they care about it, first of all, which is easy in my standpoint, because nutrition is certainly a very individualized thing. And that's one of the reasons that people I think love it because they can apply it to themselves. Um, but also that's it's an assignment that I love because you ha you can't get around it you have to <laughs> you have to input the data and analyze analyze yourself in order to to get credit for that and hopefully I mean altruistically as a registered dietitian I want individuals to learn from this and decide maybe I need to talk to my practitioner about a vitamin d supplement or I do need to eat more fruits and vegetables so um as a practitioner that's kind of <laughs> what I enjoy applying that as well back to the um, engagement and interaction piece. Um, I'm putting a supplement investigation because along the same lines of an individualized project, 
they choose a supplement of their choice and, and find some research about it. It's funny, those of you who are in science disciplines, I've had a, more this semester, I think, than ever. It was just due this past week and that, that particular project. And I had so many students asking what an abstract was, which, again, to those of us in the sciences, it's like that's a word that is commonplace. But if you're in a non-science discipline, it's kind of an unknown word. Like, what's an abstract? So I have to kind of, which is totally fine. And I love doing it because there's no reason they need to go on, you know, PubMed if they weren't in a science course or not interested in that. So I, I lead them very easily to that. It's not very involved, but they choose something that they care about or someone, if they're not taking a supplement, their roommate or their parent or someone that they're, or they find online, just something that they've seen advertised. We know they see inundated with that with social media. So I'm telling you all this to say that is something that they individually choose and, and um, is certainly a personalized assignment. I do have discussion board on Canvas for both face-to-face -face and online. Um, let me back up in a second. When I went online, I uh, my department head at the time and I were very rigorous about making sure we were maintaining the rigor of the course. And so we had a hybrid for a couple of years, actually several semesters to, and they took the same exams while learning the material differently. One was learning with asynchronous online, the other was learning with me in the course and they took the exact same exams. And interestingly, um, the online asynchronous did a little bit better than even the face-to-face. -face. So I, I'm telling that to say that I'm very proud of the way that we kept, we, we've proven the rigor of this course over the years and we didn't just throw it up online. Again, I know COVID, some of us had to do that, but this was back in 2012 when we were doing the hybrid and 2011. So um, that was a nice thing. But despite all that, I've kept the discussion boards. It was called something different on you know Blackboard a long time ago, but that's certainly a great means for RSI as well. And then uh, finally, I, I do still have plenty of multiple choice, which is honestly kind of a necessity in a large lecture course, right? Or even in a smaller course, if you have multiple courses. But I'll talk a little bit about that and integrating that with some short answer to have a little more interaction with students regarding that. And we'll talk about that um, in terms of assessment in a few minutes. Any questions so far? Anybody? Okay. If you do, please just unmute yourself and yell at me and I'll love to take those as we go. So um, just to, for those of you who know this, please forgive me for reviewing. And if you aren't as familiar with it, just to kind of define some of this regular and substantive interaction. Um, again, a lot, this is all information that's on that website that from our um, university and Igor and his crew that I mentioned earlier. And the, the link is at the end of this presentation as well, but containing at least, I won't read this word for word, you can read it to some degree, but at least two of the following of these, these um, practices that are listed. Certainly providing direct, instruction of the course content. And please note, go down to the bottom of the screen where it says a note on lectures. That should be an asterisk probably beside one, but this is, pertains particularly to me, maybe you or not. Um, I'm not sure if, again, if those of you who are teaching online, if you're asynchronous or synchronous, but they just make a point of saying a real time synchronous video lecture would count as an instruction. A recorded lecture alone would, like, would not likely count um, as direct instruction. However, if other activities or discussions emanate from the recorded lecture, then it could be counted as direct instruction. And so, I, I again, I want to kind of go back and kind of my one of my soapboxes is to tear down the <laughs> the stereotypes a lot of people have of asynchronous classes as just being very you know non interactive and. As you all know, some students love that. And with 1,500 students, you can imagine, I have the whole gamut of how people learn. And, and being aware of that, I try to have multiple things out there and, and modalities so that students can glean from that. Certainly, if they know they have to be in front of a person to learn their best, they can take my face-to-face -face course um, you know, and come to the lecture hall. But if they want to watch my lectures, they can do that. But I, I don't require, it's not like, you know, when you take a CPR class or sometimes, you know, some of the things we have to do for the university, important 
um, trainings and that sort of thing. You can't just click through the slides, right? You have to watch the totality in order to advance. I don't have that as part of mine because some students might do better just fully immersing in the material, reading it, and then doing the assignments that way. Others need both. Others really need my lectures primarily. So I try to, and as you all know, this is nothing new to you, um, but certainly having all of that counting as direct instruction. And I think breaking my lectures up into the micro lectures, I don't, I don't know, again, those of you who do asynchronous, I don't know if that's an idea that you can use or not, but I really think it's, it's a hundred percent helped the, um, you know, the fact that more people watch and more students are watching my lectures now than they used to, you know, especially the ones, like I said, I'm maternal and child health at lecture. I, it's hard for me to watch the whole thing. So I can't even watch my, the one that's, you know, two or three lecture classes worth of material. That's just a whole lot. So breaking that up into, you know, 10 or 15 smaller bites is much um, more, you know, meeting the student where they are, we, we still have to do what we have to do as instructors and um, teachers, but we still also need to meet the students so where they are to some degree so they actually will learn it and use it to, in their principles and practices. And in my, again, practitioner heart, I want them to use the things they're learning nutrition 100 in, in their daily lives directly. You know, I I tell them the first day of class, I want you to use this class every day the rest of your life. And that's a little, again, I know altruistic, but I I really try to teach my class that way that I want you today to go eat more fruits and vegetables. You know, this many you need to eat, uh, try to make that your goal. So um, doing that, even in my online asynchronous lectures, um, as much as I can provide that energy to make them feel like I'm talking to them in front of a large lecture hall, the same content. Okay, moving on. So um, assessing or providing student feedback is important. And we'll get to that in a few minutes, um, how I do that and how you could do that as well. But that could take many formats. You know, in a face-to-face -face lecture, you could have the exam and go over the answers. And you, you probably aren't going to do that if you use the same exam each semester or similar exams. But, um, you know, it could be a student asking you about questions. And that's probably what I have most is students email me about specific questions. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But I love being the content expert of that. And I ask my, I have about 10 GTAs, you can imagine, with as many students and, and sections as I have. Um, and so they're really just facilitating the student interactions of, you know, excuses and um, issues that the students have and to IT problems and that sort of thing. But content issues come to me and I love interacting and explaining why a question was written the way it was and what the answer is and, you know, what they thought about it and engaging that way. And we can sometimes meet in this online format, or, but typically email is the best way that we can communicate. Um, but assessing and providing feedback is super important. Writing information or responding to student questions um, about the course content or competency. Um, student, certainly that's important within discussions and um, you know allowing a, 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 some kind of platform of questioning and allowing making students feel comfortable in doing that. In my class, I also, I know this is unique to nutrition, but the first day of class, I, or the first time they watch my introductory lecture, um, I offer myself as like a personal dietitian to them. And because that is, um, you know, my discipline, I would love to be kind of their personal dietitian if they have a personal issue that they want to talk to. I know that's outside the realm of the course material, but it's so applicable to everything where I've never been asked a question by a student personally that doesn't directly relate back to some lesson we've had or course content. Um, but certainly, you know, whether they want to talk about training for a marathon or a supplement they're taking, or I have some students come in with their phones and like they have TikTok and they're like, is this, well, maybe not anymore, but <laughs> on campus, but they have some social media, like, is this true? Is this true? Is this true? So, um, you know, that, that kind of um, platform to allow for that in your discipline is, is nice to have that um, capability, even if they don't take advantage of it, at least they hear you saying it and they know that you're willing and interested in doing that. And the group discussions, I do that mainly through the discussion boards, um, but certainly that's helpful. We, in my face-to-face, -face, I have a discussion class, you know, that we do that to some degree as well. 
And um, then the fifth one is, uh, you know, other activities is approved by UT. So um, we'll go to that a little bit more as we as we move along. So, okay, so effective assessment. That is what I'm here to talk about today. All that build up, um, specifically talking about assessing things. So again, the reason I gave you a little snippet overview of my course, Nutrition 100, is so that I could talk about this a little more directly and it would make more sense to you. So my assessment plan for my course, this what is listed on the screen is basically their entire grade for the course in multiple ways. I also, I was telling you more as we first got on, um, in my asynchronous course, I choose to do five, but really four due dates throughout the semester. I know everybody could do that differently. You could have weekly due dates. You could have one big, huge one at the end. I just kind of had module due dates. And so the first one that I have that I mentioned is kind of a due date is just kind of get their feet wet. It's just to kind of have an introduction with each other just so they know they need to start to get going with the course. I do a kind of a contract with them. I won't get into that too much, but it does a little have to do with engagement and interaction because since we don't have a, you know, first class to show up for, you know, back in the day when, when a lot of us were in school, we were told that, you know, if you didn't come to the first day of class, you were dropped off the roll. And I, when I first started teaching here, I thought that was the case. I don't, I'm not even sure I have the capacity to do that, but some students are aware of that. So as we all know, sometimes attendance trickles a little bit throughout the course of the semester as things come up but regardless we need that first interaction to just start the course out, out on the right foot so my contract email is just them emailing me and their gta saying i've read the syllabus i understand you know what is expected of me i also have an introductory video and that sort of thing that kind of starts the asynchronous ball rolling but anyway um besides that you have four due dates of these modules uh, they have several several quizzes for different chapters throughout the text and an exam with each module. Um, and again, they they could do the I, I do put it all at the beginning of the semester. So if they wanted to, they could be they could do the whole course in a week or two if they wanted to. That's fine with me. Um, and some of them do do that, but most, as you could guess, wait until a due date, which is fine. They have the right to procrastinate until the last minute as long as they get it done. But you, I'm sure, are aware of the problems that can arise sometimes when that happens. But um, so we try to certainly have regular interaction with them throughout the semester to kind of keep them remembering what's on their plate. But this diet tracker assignment, um, that's where they do their three day record. And the first one, the first, there's four assignments just with each module they have one. The first one is just to do their three day record and input it into the system, and they get like a report that says, you know, their caloric intake and their, how they meet the micronutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals and that sort of thing. Um, so they just do that. The second, third, and fourth um, diet trackers are assessing that first one. So the first one is about macronutrients and I've broken it down to an A and a B and regarding RSI, the A part, 2A, is a multiple choice questions, which is really neat in my particular dietary analysis. It, it is directly related to their own intake. So it's like, you, you know, your consumption of vitamin A was this many milligrams. Is this above or below your recommendation? Like, it's very specific to them, which I think is really neat and um, engaging for them because the question auto fills with their own information, which is just neat um, for them to, you know, feel engaged by the questions and interact. Like it's really specific for them and catered to them. But so the first diet tracker is, is the information. The second one is about macronutrients, which is like veg, you know, um, excuse me, carbohydrates and fats and proteins, and a little bit about food groups, like fruits and vegetables and things. Then this, the third one is micronutrients, which is vitamins and minerals. And A is multiple choice. Like I said, B is um, a free response because all of the things can't be auto graded, which they shouldn't be. And so that offers more interaction with the students in terms of their asked questions like, you know, um, what, 
kind of foods could you eat to increase your intake of vitamin A? And so I've found, although it would be great if that was auto graded, there's too many variability, too much variability for it to be correctly auto graded. So we manually grade that and they can list carrots and sweet potatoes, whatever, anything high in vitamin A that they want to. And it gives them that freedom to do that as well. So I'm, 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 I'm telling you all this to say that we're mixing auto graded with multiple choice on the similar material for that increased engagement and in interaction with the students. Um, okay, moving on to the next supplement project. Um, again, it's of interest to them that we walk them through, I walk them through the questions of, you know, go into these, I literally give them the, the website to get to the articles that they're interested in, in reviewing, and then they answer some questions and about the research and about how it applies to them and the labeling of the product and that sort of thing. So again, it's very individualized and it's neat. I do get a lot of questions before that assignment. Is this okay to use this? And that's great for engagement and interaction also to say, um, yes, that's great. As long as you can find specific research about that specific supplement, um, or why don't you go this route and, and how can we explore that a little bit more of your interests? Um, again, discussion board, which I'm sure a lot of you all use is great for that interaction, student to student and instructor to student. Um, on both levels. I've found this to be highly engaging and wonderful. And, and you probably use it for similar reasons, but in my class, you know, nutrition, like I said, is a dynamic field and there's, you know, something coming out every day, almost in the media about, you know, either a new research or, or some trendy thing that is, can be controversial or not. And so I put things on my discussion board that I don't have time to cover in the context of the course, but it's interesting to talk about. Like um, an example would be gummy vitamins. There was something in the national media not long about the absorbability and what are people's feelings about, you know, are these effective? Are they teaching nutrition? Um, are they unhealthy? Are they too much sugar in them? All that kind of thing. Um, I have one about a breastfeeding baby doll when we get to maternal and child health. So anyway, some things are um, not um, to a fault controversial, but things I know some people are going to have different opinions about. So they comment and post on those. And then again, my quizzes and exams, I need to tell you are all multiple choice, auto-graded. They are. Um, and um, I'll get to that a little bit more in a second, but um, I, I keep those because with, again, with this it's a large class, it is almost essential, uh, not essential, but it is helpful from my standpoint to have those. And let me just tell you, I've been around, you know, I've been teaching this class since 2009. So I am very, and I don't, I've changed some, there's plenty of questions since that point, but I am very much of a stickler and making sure my, my multiple choice questions are not up for debate. <laughs> there's no way I've had, the ones that I've had are tried and true enough that there's no way you're going to argue me that, that, that your answer, that the correct answer is not correct. And so, and I pride myself in that because I, as a student, and if y'all remember, sometimes you would take classes and you're like, especially in health, like, well, if this was, if this happened to this patient, then this could be a correct answer. Like, what if, and I know it's maybe not the best, but I, I never, I always, upset me as a student when I could argue an answer, one of the multiple choice to be possibly true, but it was still counted as wrong. And so anyway, I, I, I'm very much um, an advocate of, of multiple choice questions that are no, indisputably correct. So, okay. So I wanted to take a second, I hope you don't mind, to kind of go through my time. And again, I'm, I'm sure everybody on here has some online component to some degree in their courses, if not fully. Um, but I just wanted to kind of go through my timeline. It's a lot of you were in connect with this because maybe you had similar thoughts. Um, and this was, again, this is going back to like 2010, 2011. So for me, this is a really long process. And some of these things are kind of laughable looking back. If, if your impetus was going, for going online was the COVID break or pivot, um, or if it's been since then, or maybe just prior to your reasons and thoughts might have been different. But I think most people, when we first think of going online, it's whatever point in your career that's been, some of these things might have gone through your mind. And how do you keep regular and substantive interaction 
and engagement part of all these steps, because especially if we're going asynchronous. So again, my, initially my concerns in my department had, we went to a little seminar. Again, this is back in 2011, 2010, um, about, you know, this possibility. And there were a little bit of blueprints to what to use, but my initial con concerns on my little timeline here were certainly cheating, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, or just people, you know, not doing their own work. And um, again, I, I know this is not the purpose of this presentation, but just to kind of connect that, um, you know, it, having more independent and individualized assignments certainly um, decreases that opportunity. Like my diet tracker, for instance, I can, and again, I gave you that background so I can just throw it out there and you know what I'm talking about, but so unless someone is doing it for someone else, which I, I that I got, it could be a possibility because they're not they're not recorded on a camera doing this, but um, it's you can't look at someone else's and and um, you know take their answers on that assignment in particular. Same with the supplement project um, and sharing of work again. That's always a concern and the rigor. Um, I told you what my department head and I did in terms of our process of coming online with a hybrid for, you know, we had the, the luxury of time to do this back in the day when we had plenty of time to make these steps and my department head was so um, focused on keeping that rigor and proving that we had the rigor, well, which we did, which was great. Um, I don't know why there's a, why these are numbered all of a sudden, but, um, but back into the middle of the screen where it says make this multiple choice, MC multiple choice questions, application-based when possible. So in some of my concerns about going online were, you know, again, the cheating or the sharing, but, or, you know, or someone's looking things up and not, I'm not saying anything against lockdown browsers and that, that thing, because I know they have their purpose and, and, and um, when people are filmed and that sort of thing, I just, my students, the feedback I get from a lot of them is anxiety related to the filming if they are filmed while they're taking um, exams and or, you know, if I'm not have a, if I'm not looking something up on a browser, guess what? I've got an entire computer <laughs> and the internet in my hand that could be hidden somewhere. So anyway, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying anything we don't know, but application-based questions, you can't, really look up on the internet as easily, you know, as in terms of like, what's a lab value that, you know, declares someone as being iron deficiency anemia, you know, you could certainly look, search that on Google very quickly, but if you had a case study, it's kind of harder to, to do that. Um, and then number two, again, I don't know why these are numbered, but on the far left-hand corner, um, having, I mentioned this earlier, having some short answer that are easily graded, and open response questions in combination with multiple choice allows for that um, regular and substantive interaction, especially when you respond with them, or we'll get to it in a minute, you know, when you can do through Canvas and, and make comments and that sort of thing on that, um, which is very helpful. But um, I also, it says lessen the weight of the multiple choice. When a long time ago, my exams, were like probably six, maybe 80, 75 to 80 percent of my students' grades. This is back when I first started in 09 or 10. And, you know, I quickly realized everybody, first of all, those that aren't great test takers or they have anxiety or whatever the case, that does disadvantage for them. And then as I've incorporated these other assignments, it's lessened the weight of these multiple choice questions, of which, you know, if they are sharing. They, there's there's less of weight and there's more weight on the things they cannot you know share and they have to do on their own independently and then again the self-assessment i've just said that meaning the diet tracker where they do their food analysis and to some degree the supplement project um keeps that rigor and opportunities for engagement so this is just my little quote on <laughs> on my feelings about multiple choice life's a multiple choice question sometimes the choices confuse you not the question itself so i this is indirectly to my thoughts about multiple choice questions being very direct. And also because I do time my exams, I haven't mentioned that yet. I don't time the quizzes. They're kind of like homework, open note, it's fine. But in order to 
um, disincentivize, you know, looking answers up and that sort of thing. I do have time limits on my exams um, to encourage, you know, and, and discourage cheating and encourage independent work. Um, okay, so um, to our point about more interaction, um, I just want to go through, you know, the difference between if you guys are using these auto-graded versus short answer questions and how they can have more RSI and more interaction. So post-assessment debriefings, um, you know, certainly in-person meeting Zoom or come to my office hours or in my face-to-face -face class, obviously that's easy to do. But again, I find email sometimes, some students aren't, don't love email. I know my children are high school be in college soon and they and their age group all says they don't, they don't like emails at this point they just you know <laughs> versus texting again it's all on their phone but um but I think by the time they get to us they understand the importance of those and just for the sake of time if nothing else it might take longer then obviously there's nothing can replace face-to-face -face interaction but um that is helpful someone can um you know you can talk about the class as a whole um, in terms of, you know, how the class did, um, averages, that sort of thing. Um, there's some questions that I know you, I'm sure you have on your exams and assessments too, that there's, there, there are more difficult questions that the students that really are getting it, get those questions correct. And the ones that are kind of struggling might not do as well. And I always try to focus my teaching in classes, especially in on my asynchronous reportings on that material that I know they're going to have difficulty with in particular on some of those questions. And so um, feedback on those after the fact is helpful as well. And then, you know, you can build in Canvas, you can, you can send feedback, you know, you're allowed to, on your, if you have questions or exams, you can have, and if you're using an independent publisher, same thing, um, you can send out questions after they turn theirs in or after everybody's done or not at all. So there's all these different steps of how you can send out, you know, the correct answers or feedback in general. Um, and this allow instructor comments directly on questions. Some of some Canvas um, assignments allow that individualized feedback, which is great for that interaction. And, um, you know, sometimes this last bullet, if they ask me a question and I have one in particular, students always get... <laughs> are not reading the question correctly, that the words are very similar. It's physiological and psychological, just so you know the exact what I'm talking about. And they, the questions, they, they aren't reading those words correctly. And so they think the, the exam is wrong. And, and that can you hear me again? Can you hear everybody hear me? I don't know what happened. Can you hear yes. me? I'm sorry. I just yep. dropped. I'm so sorry. If I can't, if everybody good, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can, but we lost you for a few, I mean, close to a minute there. I'm so sorry. Igor, tell me, do you remember what I was talking about? What was the last thing you heard before I dropped? Oh, um, let's see. On the spot. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. So my... <laughs> was it, had I gotten through auto grading? Was I talking about short answer yet? Yes. Short okay. answer, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Okay. No, it's okay. <laughs> so, um, short answer, free response questions, you know, individualized feedback, certainly. And then, um, you know, that regular interaction with students to engage those free response questions is great. And because like, for instance, in my diet tracker, I mentioned that assignment and they can talk about the foods that they consume that, you know, increase this micronutrient intake or something. And we can talk about foods that they actually will eat and, and how can they increase their fruit and vegetable intake even more. And on an individualized level, it's so important. Even when I'm just talking to the whole group, like in your mind right now, Think about 
a way that you can have five fruits and vegetables by the end of this day. So, you know, like everybody right now in your head, <laughs> how many fruits and vegetables have you eaten today? Have you eaten any? <laughs> and what can you do to have five total fruit and vegetable combined servings by the end of today? So, you know, um, making super applicable things that, that students can do. Um, okay, let me get back. To, okay, um, I know I need to, I'm, I need to, get on through this material, um, respect everyone's time. But um, these are just some things about, um, you know, weeding this out to the different types of instruction and our learner, instruct learner instructor being the most critically obviously involved with regular substantive interaction. But, um, you know, in my class and maybe in yours also, mine are recorded, yours may be recorded or synchronous. Um, and the reason I put, um, very similar to large lectures, because as I said in the beginning of this presentation, if I am talking to a large lecture classroom, it is basically the same as like right now, me talking to you all. I would love for us, for students to talk and interact and, and many um, asynchronous, even certainly synchronous, but asynchronous um, formats allow for questions during even an asynchronous presentation, which is great. And that obviously, increases RSI through the roof when you allow that students can actually ask a question and then you would as an instructor would receive those after the fact the problem comes a little bit like I told you in my class a lot of my students are done with the semester already if they worked ahead um most are not but some they could be if they wanted to be so the fact that everybody's kind of a different timeline makes that a little bit challenging as an instructor but that's the beauty of the class for the student because they can do it how they want to. Um, certainly direct student question engagement when they ask me questions. And again, I, I put myself out there as their personal dietitian, but also um, they can talk to their dietitian assistant or otherwise when they're going through this. They're, the learner, the student's interaction with the content directly, obviously through the readings. And I, I have post PowerPoints in Canvas and they do have blanks in them. I've gotten, I got mixed feedback a long time ago about blanks, but I've had blanks in my presentations, both face-to-face -face and online since I started, because I feel like it encourages and incentivizes them to actually listen and watch the, the um, recordings because, um, you know, they're a little more engaged to, to understand the important content. Um, and then, of course, material and through Blackboard and that sort of thing. And then learner to learner, through discussion board, because I require my students, as you probably a lot do too, to have a post about the topic at hand or the article or whatever they read or were talking about, and then a comment on someone else's post. And some, I think instructors are worried about, um, I don't know, politeness is not the right word, but just how the interaction might get out of control. And I've never had that happen. I'm, I'm sure there are stories to be told, but everyone's always considerate and nothing is ever off you know, in, in, inconsiderate or controversial or everyone's super supportive. And it's really a neat environment. Um, and again, my topic here, I know is not super controversial, um, but, you know, so like, yeah, me too. I had, you know, I had a discussion during COVID about what you did when you were on your COVID break in your quarantine and, and how did you, you know, what did you think about nutrition and physical activity during that time? And so that was really neat to see them engage with each other in that. Um, some of my sections have group me's on their own, some of the discussion sections, more face-to-face -face than online, but some of them do that, and that certainly is um, that type of interaction as well. Um, I know I'm very well aware that I talk fast. I hope I haven't been too um, fast and, and furious through um, these explanations, but the point of all this, I guess, is just to show you through my own context of my class is how RSI, as you read the information, your mind kind of goes directly to face-to-face -to -face, or like I said, synchronous, but hopefully through what, some of the examples I've given, you can see the incredible ways that it is possible to incorporate into asynchronous and large lecture and to have the students feel appreciated and interacted with, even though they are in a large class. And again, I know you said like 1,500 students, like how can people feel important? But I, I, in my, honestly, in my student, you know, my Tennessee voice um, 
evaluations at the end of each semester. I, I, I really have super positive feedback on students feeling appreciated and whether through my own interaction with them or their GTA or even just the material itself because they feel like they can apply it to themselves directly. And you know, I know that's partly my discipline and my material, but it um, certainly helps in that process. And, and then just a note about um, there are always ways to be creative and, and, and have more interaction. Although we, we, I know you all have great classes and we, and courses and ideas, but we can always try different ones. Even each semester trying different ones is, is fun. Um, these are these resources. I don't know if you, I know you don't want to write this down, but, um, I'm sure Igor has these sent out, but there's a, a I won't show my screen about that, but there's a best practices for online instruction, which has great information. I know that's not particularly what this um, presentation is about either, but they were fab, they're fabulous um, kind of best practices. And then that second one about RSI has some of the information that, that I listed in there 